Frank, how old were you when you decided you were going to go to film school? Well, I didn't actually go to film school first. So I'm going to go back as far as seven. I got brought to Manhattan by my parents and I was from suburbia, Long Island. And I remember walking down Times Square and it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Like smoke coming out of the sidewalks, people, you know, with boom boxes, just all that activity and energy. And I realized, okay, I got to get out of my small town and end up in New York City. So when the time came to pick a college, I was like, I'm going to New York. I'm like, that seems like the coolest place on the planet. And it's like only two hours away from where I grew up. Um, and I applied to NYU. At the time, I didn't know movie making was an actual occupation. I love movies. <laughs> I was from a very business background family. So my sister said, oh, go for business. I go, okay, I'll apply for business. And I got into the um, business school and I got there my first day to my dorm, got out of a cab and there were students with film cameras making movies. And I was like, I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> I love movies. <laughs> um, so I quickly enrolled in a film class. Um, and I think it was my first semester and um, it was called Film Now. I had this amazing uh, teacher named Nick Tannis and we would see movies. It was a Thursday night class. It was, you'd see movies and all week you'd see shorts by the filmmaker and then you'd see their feature film. So we'd see like shorts from Godard and then we'd see Breathless and we'd see like all the workings that went into the way the director came to make his movie. And we'd study different movies like it or different genres. Um, but the one moment that I think did it for me was I was what, 18, 17, 18. I had not seen It's a Wonderful Life by Frank Capra. And this teacher, Nick Tannis, said, you know, I'm going to show the movie tonight. And then if anybody wants to stick around, it was Thursday night. There was no class on Friday in college. So we got drunk Thursday night. He said, if anyone wants to stick around, you go through the movie with a flashlight and tell you how the director did certain things. So we watched the movie. It's first time I'd seen it. And, you know, Frank Capra, one of my favorite filmmakers uh, has been since that day. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life just touched me, moved me, um, was blown away. And then when the teacher said, well, anybody wants to stick around, I'll show you why a director made certain decisions. I thought a person made decisions to make me feel this way. I literally, it was that early on in that I think when you grow up, when I did, you didn't think about, there wasn't as much behind the scenes making of the movies. So you just went to see a movie. So suddenly this whole idea of a person was behind it you know, making me feel all these very strong emotions that I felt like, what a great story, a great storyteller. I sat through the class and I couldn't fathom how this man was a genius and could do this thanks to this teacher, Nick Tannis. And I thought, oh my God, I have to figure out how to do this. And that was it. I just switched full on into filmmaking and was obsessed from that day on to be able to try to touch people. And I, I thought there's no way I could do this when, in that moment, but I'm like, but if there's any small chance, I have to try. <laughs> Did you see any parallels between It's a Wonderful Life and then growing up? Was it, sorry, Staten Island, Long Island? Where, sorry? Where, where did you grow up again? Oh, Staten Shirley, Island? Long Island. Shirley, Long, okay. Yeah. Is that near, I don't know. Like, Shirley is like, like a little blue collar town. It's, it's funny because it was far enough out that people didn't commute to New York City unless they went to a concert. And a lot of people would just go to a concert and get back <laughs> on the train. I pretty quickly was aware that like, that's the coolest city in the world, I think. <laughs> so let me explore. So I was going into New York City at 15, 16, you know, going, this is great, you know, exploring. And then, yeah, that's why I ended up at NYU to, to kind of, I just knew there was more to learn about life and that New York City would be the backdrop where I would do that. Did you see parallels between your own life and It's a Wonderful Life and that he didn't want to be stuck working in, a, in this small town and he, and he wanted more, there was more adventure he wanted? I didn't at the time see that. I think it, it grew on me over time. Um, but the bigger uh, thing about that movie that always stayed with me was just he spent his life being a good person and being generous and, and he was at the point to literally kill himself. And, and you know, through realizing how much he affected everyone, uh, it made his life worthwhile. And I thought uh, if a movie can like just make you in an hour and a half kind of live through a life, a person's experience to have such a big change of heart and thought about his whole life. It's like, what a powerful piece of art. What a powerful storytelling that it could actually change somebody's life. And you walk out of the theater being like, 
I'm going to be more generous. I'm not going to count every penny that comes in or goes out. And, and so that, that just that power is what did it. I wasn't so much the small town thing. Maybe subconsciously, now, now that you're saying it, it seems really uh, apparent. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you met Adam Sandler? Uh, yeah, very, very well. Um, I was at NYU and um, I, I had known him in the dorm because he used to do stand up at we had a thing called the coffee shop, the coffee house. It was like a variety show and I had seen him and, and it's, it's the Britney dorm, small dorm in Manhattan. Um, and I only knew him just as, hey, that's Adam Sandler. And, um, and my roommate said, hey, Adam wants to hang out with us tonight. I go, oh, that's cool. He seems pretty cool. And him and Tim and Tim is Tim Hurley who wrote a bunch of my movies and Ad, uh, most of Adam's movies. Um, so we hung out and we went out and had a typical college night of, uh, you know, drinking and whatever. And, and uh, we lived in, um, it, was, it was New York, right? So we lived in this hotel, it was our dorm room, and we were five to a room. So what would happen is if you got home really late and your roommates were sleeping, we had these giant, luckily we had these giant closets, like, like literally like walk-in closets from an old hotel. So it was a pretty common thing to, if you're up late, keep the lights out, go into the, the, the closet with your friends. So we all had a great night of fun, made each other laugh all night, and sat in the closet all night and just made each other laugh. And it's funny because when I was in high school, I, I, I had a best friend that we had all these sort of like funny sounds and noises we make. And I remember thinking, all right, I'm off to college. That fun's gonna be over, but I'll find a new kind of fun. And then sure enough, my freshman year, I meet Adam and Tim and my roommate, Jack Arpito, who produced my movies. And uh, there we are, kind of doing what you do in college, smoking some weed and making each other laugh and, uh, and making bizarre noises. <laughs> and uh, that was just the beginning of us saying, man, we're gonna live, we're gonna, we said we'd live next to each other every year across the hall and we did. And, and then we're like, we kept coming up with funny ideas and we would write comedy songs and I was in film school and I would come up with funny ideas and Adam would be in my short films. And so we just started our collaborative uh, creative process way back then. Yeah, Adam would do stand up. By the senior year, he was doing stand up like six nights a week. So we would always go and sort of be a bouncing board, a creative bouncing board. And it was fascinating to see him go up on, the thing about stand up is people go up over and over to the point where you're just bored of doing it. But you go up sometimes with a half-baked idea and just to see what you get back, you get kind of brave as a stand-up. And uh, it would be interesting to see some stupid idea that we thought, oh my God, that tanked. And two, three weeks later, it would be the main part of his act, you know, like Elvis in the fridge or, or like some really surreal stuff. Um, so yeah, it was fun to be part of that sort of coming up with his sort of brand. It was kind of our brand of comedy, which we, eventually brought to some of the movies that we did together. Do you remember any of the TV shows or films that you would maybe watch together or just say, we want to do stuff like this? The, the funny thing is I was like, we always, I went to NYU thinking, I just want to do little art, weird, out there movies. And Adam was great because he, those are the movies he would love to go to see with me. Like Basquiat, he loved. Like all these little, Indies were the ones that he responds to. It's funny, he, he would go see a lot of comedies and he would get bored and walk out. <laughs> Even though he wanted to do comedies and I'm like, no, I want to do these kind of like cool, edgy, push the envelope. And uh, um, yeah, so I, I just remember more of like, you know, like we saw Blue Velvet and it was like nothing else we'd seen. I think what attracted me and, and him is, is seeing movies that tonally did things. That's the thing about a movie that you can create that you, that's hard to do in a book or other mediums um, I guess now you can do it on TV, is create a different tone. I think like Quentin Tarantino's success is he mixed violence with comedy in a way nobody had at the time. And his tone is very different. And, and it's, that's, you know, when you think of just straight dramas, they start to become very similar. But once you start to get into either, you know, comedy is usually where it becomes more about the tone. Uh, you know, there's a million different kinds of comedies and, and, and some could be dark and some could be satirical and some could be, you know, just every version. Some could just be really in your face, stupid and slapstick. Um, and you start to realize, I, 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 at first I was like critical, like, I don't want to do comedy. I don't want to do comedy. And then the more I was analyzing what I was doing and seeing movies, I realized so much of it is tone and then so much you can affect tone with 
irony and, and all these things that have to do with humor. Um, I had a moment where I was like looking at my dog one day. I was kind of stoned and, uh, and I was thinking, <laughs> it's my dog. I can, I can, he gets, he gets happy. He gets sad. He, he can, uh, he, I can scare him, um, but I can't make him laugh. I jump around the corner. I do something and he would just never. And, and I'm like, well, he definitely can't get irony. So I, at that point, it was when I was first making, I was somewhere around the wedding singer, Water Boy, and I was being a little critical of like, I didn't want to make comedies. I had this revelation that I go, well, what other animals laugh? And then I was like, well, dolphins, I guess, kind of laugh and like monkeys and gorillas. And I'm like, and humans. And I'm like, maybe I shouldn't be so critical that I'm making comedies because it takes intelligence to understand humor. Not to take anything away from a drama, but there's more levels of nuance and uh, subtlety uh, that go into comedy. So I feel better now that I've made comedies, even though my most recent movie is more of a drama. <laughs> Who had bigger dreams at that point, you or Adam? I think we had a very similar um, quest to do something important. Um, uh, I, my mom always gave me the feeling that like you could, you, you know, believe in yourself, you can do whatever you need to do. And um, when I said I was going to make films, I got nervous. <laughs> my dad, all he knew was the godfather and he said, you're going to be a director? The mafia is going to own you because all they can think about is the horse's head in the bed. <laughs> and I'm like, no, dad, they, 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 don't, they don't really do that. That's only in the movies. They just have the Teamsters. <laughs> um, um, but I just had uh, big goals. And Adam always, since I met him, wanted to be the funniest man on the planet. And, uh, and so his drive was very strong to do that. Um, uh, so in a good way, it overlapped. I, you know, my, my thing was I just wanted to tell... I felt like I had... I felt like things were obvious to me, like like greed is bad. And all these people in the 80s are being really greedy and they're being money hungry. And it, it was just really apparent to me that was an empty, an, an empty fulfillment if you're just going for the money. It, like in my head, it was like, oh, it's about how you get the money. It's about don't you want to create something or and and so I realized oh, I have an insight that not everybody has. And then when I the idea of making movies and how powerful they were, I thought, if I could figure this out, I can hopefully tell stories that are worth telling because I always go back to how much as a kid movies shape who you are. It's like you have your parents and you have whatever religion you're brought up. But at the end of the day, I think movies have a massive, massive effect on, 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 on who you become and your sense of right and wrong, your sense of who a hero is, your sense of, you know, what's it just really sets up so many mores at a young age, when I think about making my movies, a lot of them have been for a small, a younger audience like kids. It's super important to me to, to think about, you know, a kid going to see a movie with his parents or alone or when they're hanging out with all their buddies, how it's going to affect them. So I've definitely embraced, especially when I was making some of the um, more fun comedies like The Water Boy and, and it's like, like they're bullying the kid. And I thought, this is, I'm doing something good, even though they seem like just pure entertainment and it's just dumb. There's a real story, there's real heart, they're real characters. I always try to anchor my characters in real people. Even though The Water Boy was kind of a big over the top movie, at the end of the day, me and Adam, we chose to play him like a real guy, like, like Rain Man, except some of the choices we make are silly. When he tackles, he made crazy noises. But he, he's the reality that I create in my movies, I try to keep totally real. So that I try to keep true to the reality you set up. It doesn't shift. So once you're in that world, you believe that world and then you invest in the characters. And my thing is I want to make movies that even though they're comedies, when they are comedies, in the third act, you really are hooked in your seat where a lot of comedies sort of fall apart in the third act because the stakes don't really matter. Um, so that's, I know I'm going on a tangent, but I'm just kind of ra rambling. But yeah, stakes, having a reality that's believable with stakes that you care about, to me, is a really important part of telling a story. Well, going back to the topic of greed, how did, you know, how the term yuppie was sort of coined in the 80s and sure. all the gentrification going on in New York City, probably around that time. Yeah, exactly. I don't know Yuppies, BMWs, all that, yeah. Right, and a lot of people being forced out of apartments and things like that. Did that, growing up as a kid and seeing some of that, did that shape you at all? I know you were more on... Well, it's funny, it, it, when I think of... The movie I just did now is all about how polarized we are and how we shouldn't be. 
And in a weird way, it was the beginning of us being a little bit polarized. It's funny because in my dorm, I had like weird art I found on the street and my roommate uh, who went on to be um, pretty staunch Republican had um, Ronald Reagan as a cowboy, Alf, a poster of money <laughs> and a bottle of Jack Daniels. But, um, it, 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 but it, at the time it was, I'm going to get into the polarization. It was like you can have different things you lean towards, but we could all talk. And, and what's really hard for me right now, and, and I, I do want to talk about it because it's super important to the movie. I think I might have made one of the most important movies I've made thus far is since 9-11, I've been seeing the world just got really polarized. And not just, I travel I, a lot. I thought first it was in our country. Every country is super polarized. People are going far right far left um, and it's getting very tribal and it's losing everything that I think that's important. To me, the most important things are honesty and integrity. And I think in the hope to fight for your side, people are willing to look the other way at, at things that are wrong. They're willing to lie. They're willing to embellish the truth. and. I think when that happens, we're just going to fall apart as, as, you know, as a civilization. And I am super worried about that um, because I do think that it's irrational. Uh, we're allowing irrational behavior. We're, we're not um, making people accountable for when they do something wrong. And, you know, if you talk about like whatever in politics, it's like if you say, well, Donald Trump, it's not right that he did that. And instead of saying, yeah, it's not right. You shouldn't do that. They go, but Hillary did that. And it's like, it, they're two separate stories. Maybe what he did was wrong and maybe what Hillary did was wrong. The point is, we need to focus on what's right and wrong. Um, and so that has just gotten worse and worse. And I love technology. I think the internet has the ability, it, had the, it sort of backfired on us just in that People are losing empathy for each other because when we sit across from each other and have an argument and I say something and I see your emotion and I see your hurt, I will, as a human being, react to that and be like, wow, that wasn't really right what I said. That was a little bit crazy. On the internet, there's no face and people tend to just not listen to the other side and they just want to get out what they want to say and it just gets meaner and meaner. And I love technology and I wouldn't want to take it away I just think we need to evolve as humans to be more empathetic without seeing someone's face and be more open to the fact that we may be wrong sometimes and ultimately just be, uh, um, to be more effective, like we need to listen to each other and, and not get so polarized. And the 24 hour news cycle didn't help that. Um, and it's gotten just worse because, you know, whichever way you lean, it seemed like Fox started from my perspective. And then I, I, I watch a lot of the new shows I've always watched. And it's so reactionary now that it's almost escalating. And it's like, I just kind of wish there was just the news, uh, just facts. And, 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 and yeah, it's been concocted into this crazy world. And, and, and it's hard to go home during um, the holidays and, and sit around the table with people that have opposite opinions. We literally in my home have brought up like no politics at the table. And then smart. sometimes we go into it and then it's like, we all go, all right, we love each other. And let's not talk about that. So I, I, the movie I just made is called Hot Air. I was, uh, had this idea for a while in my head and um, that we need to fix this. And um, a script got sent to my manager and she sent it to me, uh, Ali Eatry, and it was uh, called Hot Air. And uh, my producing partner, Amy Keene, read it. And she was like, wow, Frank, this is what you've been talking about. But it's a beautiful little small story. Uh, and she knew I wanted to go back and make an indie because my first movie was an indie and we can get into that in a little bit. Um, and I read this story and it was a beautiful story about just a small family drama. It just happened to be that the lead was a right-wing talk show host a la, you name, you know, Rush Limbaugh, whoever. Um, and his niece comes into his life that he had never met from his estranged sister who he hated. And um, she's about to go into foster care because her mom's gonna go into rehab. And she sort of inserts herself in his life and he wants to have nothing to do with her. And she's as clever as him and says, well, 
if you uh, put me back into foster care, you're gonna, I'm gonna tweet a message saying, you're putting me back into the social services that you rag on all the time, you know? And then he realizes this niece is really smart. And the movie's about the two of them going head to head. And, you know, it's not like at the end of the movie, he becomes a liberal and, you know, but by the end of the movie, he becomes a better human by listening to her. And everyone in the movie shifts just a little bit and they're able to communicate. And, and that, the goal of the movie was to make a movie that you can see this movie with your Republican or your liberal or your conservative family and you can all go together and you can come home and be like, all right, I'll listen to what you have to say this time. So I, it seems to have been getting that kind of response that's coming out this weekend. So I'm excited to see if it affects people in the way that I hope it does. Even if it's a few people, it'll be great. Did you used to watch a lot of the 90s talk shows? Do you remember like somebody would get up in front of Geraldo or Jerry Springer and it was calm for a little bit and then the first one stood up <laughs> and threw the first rock and then it was on. I kind of was like one of those guys that was like anti that. Oh, you were? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I found them fascinating. And uh, I, I just remember a story because um, Juliette Lewis had done a movie with Adam and she used to watch them all day and just imitate people. And then you realize how she's so good at doing that. <laughs> just a little offshoot, a little side shoot. Um, yeah, I wasn't a big fan of those shows. I, 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 they just kind of bugged me because I felt like they were just cashing in on people's, um, they're just pushing buttons and, you know, and it was like watching a, a train crash. You can't turn the other way, but I was able to turn the other way. So that wasn't my thing. I loved Letterman. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah I love things like humor. that. I like that yeah. he was not. A, I like that he was not always soft on everyone. That's true. I always like that he would either like somebody and be cool with them, and if he didn't like them, he would. He would needle him a little. Yeah, he's yeah, good at yeah, that. But he would yeah. do it with with a little with bit class yeah. and, 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 and and dignity and all those nice things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I just was curious if the sort of the evolution of those those talk shows has now turned into people in comments and, and how we I think are. it has. Look, it, it, you know, it, it all goes back to me to integrity. It's because like you read a headline and it's like the headline is just to like exacerbate something or just inflame and, and you realize they just want to click and it's, it's we're in this just get do anything for attention even at the expense, you know, like sometimes the headline's just misleading and then the misleading headline becomes what everybody talks about and it creates rumors you know what I mean? It's like, so I just think people have to have integrity. If you just, that's the bottom line. Integrity includes honesty, uh, you know, uh, uh, treating people fairly. It's like, if everyone had integrity, it would be such a nicer world. And, and we used to have more and we're having less now. It was never perfect. And we're always a work in progress. Um, but I feel like this whole idea of being a work in progress is, is almost thrown out the window. I mean, I'm gonna just tangent into guns and it's like we have all these problems with people wanting gun control and other people saying, well, they're gonna take guns away and, and like, look, it's never gonna be perfect, but we have a problem. And what always made America a great country is we would work on fixing the problem. You know, I think, I think it was like Trevor Noah was talking about like, we had problems with cars. So then you put, you know, you make people wear seat belts and you create rules and like, and that's what made this country great. and and and. I feel like now we're not willing to even, because people are taking such sides, we're not even willing to work on fixing it, even if it's baby steps. And, 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 and that's, you know, I get, I'm getting into all these social issues because I'm a filmmaker and it's starting to become so important uh, to me that we start fixing some of these things because I just feel like it doesn't feel like it's gonna be a great world in 20, 30, 40 years. And I don't have kids yet, I wanna have kids. And my friends have kids and I'm just like, I want to do it for them. <laughs> Sometimes you can show your side of something. Doesn't mean you change someone's opinion, but with humor. So if you show someone a documentary that's clearly biased, people are going to, oh, well, this filmmaker just, you know, this is the lobbyist paid him to do, you know, these different things. But humor is a very effective way of getting people to kind of let down their guard and maybe for one moment entertain something whether it's their own fault in something or just seeing something in a different light yeah, yeah. so that's one thing. you know here's it's funny this is a blueprint for storytelling and it's not quite humor but it what what's great about really great storytelling if you think of and i've used this as a model in some of my movies to kill a mockingbird to me in so many ways is like 
brilliant storytelling. And, and, and I'll explain pretty simply why. And this is the only book she wrote, right? Then the movie's great. Um, the movie's about racism. And there's, uh, I remember well, there's a, um, a young black fellow who's being tried for something he didn't do. And it, as a viewer of the audience, you're thinking, how could these people be so biased and racist? And, 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 and you're, you just can't fathom it, right? The subplot in the story is the kids have a neighbor, Boo Radley, and they're sort of totally afraid. He's the boogeyman. And as the story unfolds, and the audience is super afraid of him, and you're like horrified of this Boo Radley guy. And you're thinking, man, this is kind of crazy, but that guy's, you know, evil for sure. By the end of the movie, he ends up being the sweetest man possible. And I thought, well, that's brilliant filmmaking because you look at them and go, how could they be racist towards this young black kid? Meanwhile, as the audience, you were racist towards this guy, Boo Radley, because you didn't know enough about him. And it was the ignorance. And, and to me, that's like perfect storytelling. We were actually sucked into being racist and now we can suddenly relate to why other people can be racist and it has to do with ignorance and it's just those layers is like what makes storytelling amazing and you know you can do it even more in, in movies with, with those kind of layers but you know it all starts with the writing and then it comes to the next level which is the which is the movie um for me that's the way i look at it obviously books stand on their own um, yeah, so um, I don't know how I got that tangent, but that, that's sort of a model. So I made the movie Around the World in 80 Days, and I used that sort of template. I wanted the movie to be about travel and how it opens you up, because I've traveled my whole life, and, and I think a lot of Americans didn't travel enough, and the more you travel, the more you get more you know, tolerant and, and understanding of other cultures, and you're suddenly not fearful, and it just makes you a better person, and it makes you more well-rounded. And in the story, Phileas Fogg is an inventor, and he's up against the uh, Royal Academy of Science, and they believe that everything that could be invented has already been invented. And he thinks, how could these guys be so pig-headed and, and, and not believe this? And he gets in this adventure to go around the world. Meanwhile, he, in his own right, is really pig-headed and closed-minded and, and isn't open to art and all these other things. But he goes on this journey around the world. He meets Jackie Chan, plays Passport 2. He meets a French artist. He, he doesn't even know what art is, and he thinks it's crazy and stupid and a waste of time. By the end of the movie, he becomes a full rounded person. He gets to fully realize his dream that a man can fly. And he they, uh, wins to bet on a flying machine. I embellished the original book and movie. And, and to me, it was the same. I used um, uh, um, To Kill a Mockingbird in that make him see them as one way and then realize he himself was as, as close minded as they were. So that, that kind of like double layer thing is a great device that you can use in storytelling and, and uh, so yeah I, I, I like that kind of stuff when there's layers going on like that. Did you work any day jobs while you were either at NYU or afterward? Yeah okay when I was at NYU I, I was very cool to, and still is I guess but um, there was probably a lot more than um, vintage clothing store. <laughs> I was a new wave kid it was cool to live in Manhattan and, and I worked at a place called the Antique Boutique. Um, and I didn't get paid very much. I don't want to say how much because it'll show how old I am. I think it was like three fifty <laughs> an hour, believe it or not, minimum oh, okay. wage. Mm -hmm. um, I did that because my dad was paying for my college, and I felt like I wanted to work during school. Um, uh, and then soon after school, I did anything I could to work in film in any way. And that's advice I give to kids: is like, if you're going to have to take a job, even if don't make it be about the money at first, unless you're really lucky. Um, I worked literally as a PA on commercials. I just was excited to be on set to see how a real set worked. But really, what I had to do was drive a cube truck around, pick up C stands, get really greasy and dirty, um, and you know, get the food table ready and all that stuff. But I kind of feel like I learned from the bottom up uh, how things run, and um, I was a really good PA. Um, and then. The difference then and now is you get you go to film school and you get to direct a movie. It's like the ultimate privilege to direct a movie. Um, once you graduate, you're like, oh my god, I don't have cameras, I don't have film. Um, it's not like now with iPhones and and you can edit on your iPhone and your laptop. So all I did was want to get to a job where I could have equipment. So one of the next jobs I took was um, 
while I was PA and I ended up getting an opportunity to work for a shy at day advertising. I was in New York, so there wasn't a lot of, I, I wasn't in, in, uh, uh, introduced to the movie world, so I would work on commercials because that's what was going on in the early 90s, late 80s. Um, I got to edit reels and stuff, and then I got to use the editing equipment, and then I had a camera, so we would go and shoot shorts, and then on the weekend, and then we'd film them. And then from that job, I parlayed that into doing travel documentaries. This travel company had sent, actually Jack Perez, it's funny you interviewed him, had done the first one for this travel company, I believe it was Jack, and they did one and didn't want to do another one, and I saw this opportunity to um, travel. I was like, oh my God, I'm 22, 23. I can travel the world. I can direct. The funny thing was we were directing a video for a bus tour, like a bus group tour. So it was literally a lot of silver haired <laughs> people. Affluent, yeah. <laughs> but I was super <laughs> excited to travel uh -huh. Australia, New Zealand, all over the world. And for me, it was, it was getting to film, to direct. I was shooting, I was a director, but I would also shoot. And then we would um, edit the pieces together. And it was just going through the process from beginning to end. Um, and I, it's funny, I think about these travel documentaries that were given to people to go on the bus tours. And we would have heated arguments about f four, four frames on an edit. <laughs> I, I think back when I'm like making features, like we used to fight over just these stupid travel documents. But it's that same kind of application of like, you really want it to be great um, that you just keep doing. Um, but so yeah, I did that and uh, yeah, which leads me to say like kids always ask me like our students, not kids, but they're like, what, what, you know, what should I do? And I'm like, I wished when I got out of film school that I had an HD camera and you have one in your hand. And, and the, the most learning you ever do in filmmaking is not starting a film, it's finishing a film. So it's so hard because when you first start, what you have in your head and what you get, there's a, unless you're a, a prodigy, there's a big difference of what you want and what you get. So then getting to the end and editing it ends up being really painful. Because you're like, you imagined it to be this and the shot's not that, and it's not lit the way you wanted and the camera. But by getting to the end, you have to finish it. The learning curve is so great by finally getting done and it's so painful that that's when you learn everything. So the second time you do it, you really don't make those mistakes. You make a whole set of new ones, but you've just got a whole bunch of knowledge. Um, and, and I just tell people, go out, write a story. Don't, don't beat yourself up, just have fun. Write a story, get your friends together. You don't even need to spend a lot of money and film it. And I'm shocked now, because I think of movies like, um, was an Ed Burns made Brothers McMullen. He did his credit cards, and I think for like whatever, it was 15, 30 grand. He made this movie on 16 millimeter and the guy had a great career and he made a bunch of films and he became an actor. I'm shocked now that there's not, there's, and there's so many places to play your movie. I don't know why more people aren't going and shooting a feature length film. You can make it for nothing. You make it for a grand or you know, bar $500 even if you want. As long as you got time on your hands and edit that thing, if you can afford an iPhone or borrow one, edit it and put it on YouTube. And if it's a really good movie, there's no reason somebody can't make a really good movie. Some of the most amazing things you do are when you're really young as a filmmaker, because you're fearless. So I just, I recommend people just keep making, start with shorts and, 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 and keep working your way to make a feature film. If you really want to make a film now, you can. And you can find an audience. I wonder how much of something being forbidden makes you love it more because I remember also seeing cameras in the Sears catalog. I'm old enough to remember the Sears catalog and they were way too expensive. There was no way I could ever have one. Uh -huh. But I kept looking at the page thinking if I had that, what would I be doing? Mm -hmm. and because the, it was forbidden to me, it became more special. Yeah. So I just wonder having so much access, does that almost hurt it? Well, it's like reason. anything, constraints, constraints, deadlines make us better. It's like just a human nature is if you don't have a gun to your head, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you learn to self inflict the gun, but you don't make it a gun. You just get yourself to sit down and do the work. It's like writing when you think about it is like is you have you have no constraints. You can write about anything. And, and sometimes that's the hardest script to write. It's like when somebody says you have to write something with three characters has to take away from one house. And one. the minute you start putting walls and constraints, is the minute you start getting ideas. 
So it's a lot more, you have to self um, uh, discipline yourself when there's no constraints. So I think that's the reality. But I hope when I say this, like go and make a film, make a short film. I hope some people do. I know that's a lot of, a lot of people make short films for sure. But then I think they realize how hard it is. And it's hard to have the gumption to, to make a full feature length because it's a long and grueling um, task. And, and there's no, you know, it, it's like if you have somebody giving you the money and distribution deal, well, then there's a, 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 a motivating goal. Um, but I think if you could self-motivate, you can become, a, you could be nobody. And if you have an iPhone, you can become a great filmmaker. And you'll eventually get hired. <laughs> Have you always been a self-starter? I always try, but I, you know, we, I like any creative person. You wrestle with like, I think I'm being lazy. I think I'm. I still haven't done my movie. And then I spent time with Paul Thomas Anderson. We were in Hawaii because Adam knows him well, and we're friends. Um, great director, right? One of my favorites. And I remember him sitting there going, "I still haven't made my movie." And I'm like, you're saying that? And I was <laughs> oh like, oh, gosh. good. If you're saying that, then at least I know I'm, I don't feel as bad about myself saying that. So, so I think this uh, the tortured artist is you don't think you're a self starter, but obviously we've gotten ourselves this far. So, you know, but you have to self motivate, and and the best reward is when you do it, you feel great, and when you don't do it, you feel miserable. <laughs> right, and then this inertia sets in with everything. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Is filmmaking an addiction? Is filmmaking an addiction? Oh, that's a tough one. I couldn't do anything else. I, I, I feel like, if, you know, like if I ever, when I hear people retiring, I'm like, I've never retired. I'm just gonna make films until I can't. <laughs> until they stop. I think it's a privilege. So it's less addiction for me and it's more privilege. And I don't, every time I make a film, I don't want, that privilege taken away. So I'm super grateful that I get to make movies. And think about it, like, hey everybody, come into my brain. People are gonna give me millions of dollars or a million dollars or many millions. They're gonna be all these talented people and what I have in my brain, I get to show to a bunch of millions of people. So it's like, it's a privilege to get that. And, and, and I, I, I feel that way every day. Uh, it's not an addiction, but it's something I would never not do. How's that? <laughs> How do you know you wouldn't be? I mean, I know you said you worked at a used clothing store and you were like this new waiver. That sounds a rock star would be okay. another thing I'd like to okay. be. Okay, because but that, David that, that's much more about <laughs> your own fulfillment. Because I mean, you know, you see a rock star on the stage and oh yeah, and all these women. And, yeah. and that'd be great, but I don't think I would be still alive if I did that. And uh, I think I, I think honestly, music could give a lot to people. But sure, um, I, I, there's something about filmmaking that just sits well with me. It's like, it's very, it takes a lot of thought and premeditation, there's a lot of layers to it. And, and um, I, the other thing I do for fun is I DJ. Uh, and I think the reason I do that is because film's so premeditated. And the other two things I do is DJ and cook. They're both like riding, cooking's like riding a wave. You have to do it at the moment. You know, it's not premeditated as much. And, and DJing is like immediate reaction, play music, people respond, you react to them. Um, I find it fascinating. I went to go see the movie Time Code a few years back by Mike Figgis. And there was this brilliant idea he had that there would be four screens and all the actors had a, literally a watch with Time Code. And he choreographed almost like a live play um, where everybody had to do a certain thing at a certain time. And it was a, a fictional story he created with you know drama and arguments. And I can't remember if it was shootings or anything. Um, like Salma Hayek was in a bunch of great actors. and. Uh, they probably did a number, I think he said they did 13 or 14 takes because it was one take when you finally saw the movie and everything was choreographed. That Like somebody would leave that room and end up on the street and all the cameras are in different places. And I thought, well, that's fascinating. And then I, when I went to see it, Mike Figgis, um, I said the New Art Theater here in, in LA, uh, Mike Figgis actually live mixed um, the four stories and he said it for him it was fascinating because normally the movie went out without a mix and and he would raise and lower different stories but by actually being in the theater depending on how he felt the audience was responding he would raise the volume more he would kind of guide the people a little bit to where they were going and i just thought that's such a cool element to add to filmmaking if there's a way to make it like interactive for the director that you can change it um 
uh, I, I don't know. It just was a fascinating thing because, again, movies are so premeditated. You sort of do it and then you put it out there and that's it. Um, I do find TV is something I want to do because I um, went to school with Vince Gilligan at NYU and he created one of the best TV shows, I think, Breaking Bad. And when I started to hear him talk about it, um, Jesse Pinkman, who ends up being kind of the main, sort of the co-main character and eventually becomes sort of the moral point of view of the audience. He was supposed to die in, I think, the first season or halfway through the first. And I, I think it's fascinating that in TV that you, you have this living thing that you're like, oh, people are liking Jesse. And, his, and, and they start to even see, between them, the, the creative people seeing what's working and the audience responding, it becomes its own thing. And I, I'm fascinated that my next step is to get involved in, in cable TV. I always go like, where did all the edgy 70s movies go? And I go, they went to cable. <laughs> there are TV now. Um, so that's, that's an exciting thing, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, gauging the audience's reception because I've been in some movies as, as an audience member where I'm the only one laughing and it's a little bit disconcerting because then mm. I think, well, I guess I have to kind of tone it down. <laughs> and then I, I went to see the Mike, Mike Wallace documentary. And most people there were probably 20 years older than myself and they were loving it. Uh -huh. And then I felt free. I could like laugh. And, and But then you, I went to see Vice and no one was, you know, it was total silence. Total and it, silence. sometimes it depends on the area yeah. that you see the film. Oh, definitely the area. Even the time. Oh, that's true. <laughs> when you're, because when you're, I want pop my head in theaters sometimes. And do you? Like, yeah, and then we also do previews of our movies a lot. And, and uh, yeah, a late audience, if they're drunk, it's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> but different regions will react differently. Different economic levels yes. will laugh at different things for Definitely. sure. Um, it, yeah, so it is interesting when you're making a movie because you can't make everybody happy. Um, but I guess you got to make sure you make yourself happy and then hopefully you get a lot of people in there with you. <laughs> True, and one I saw in the suburbs, and the other one I saw in more of a city-like city, yeah, yeah. area, and yeah. so there was a difference in reaction, and it's interesting to see, too, who claps after movies as well. Yeah, I, I gotta say that one one of the greatest, greatest feelings, not as much as being a rock star, and going, ah, but <laughs> I, I will sneak into a theater and, and see how my movie's doing in the real world, and like, you premiere, obviously people are gonna clap because they know you're there, but I've had... I've watched my movie play and people applaud and it's such a great feeling because you're like, are they paid to see my movie and they're applauding? <laughs> so that, that fulfillment, is, is, it makes it all worthwhile. It makes all the hassle and all the hard stuff that goes along with filmmaking so worthwhile. Was it this is, an industry town where you saw this? Uh, where I've they clap? I'm different places. Oh, um, wow. I've done it, uh, but it was definitely regular people. It wasn't yeah. just people in the industry. Oh, no, no. It was like people on a Saturday afternoon oh, nice. that went to see my, you know, I think it happened with um, Around the World in 80 Days for sure, uh, Click for sure. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Cool. it's fun. You do all that work, you kind of want to pop your head in now and then and see how it's playing. Right, and not have it where they're performing for the director. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a right. true test. It's scary. Very cool. <laughs> and sometimes you're like, why didn't they laugh at that joke? They laughed at the previews. <laughs> you're writing stuff down. Like, there's this guy in the back writing everything down. <laughs> Who's that jerk? <laughs> Your first film, or feature film, was Murdered Innocence? Murdered Innocence. It's kind of like I lost my virginity on it. Okay, oh, my wow. I hope she called you afterwards. <laughs> not, not literally. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. I was murdered innocence. I lost my innocence. <laughs> okay, um, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, it was funny. I was, um, I was, I had made short films. I had made a thing with Adam. I did a short with Adam Sandler because he was, I was, he was at SNL. And I had this reel I put together of just anything and everything I could shoot. I had a PSA and, uh, and I was, I was obsessively, trying to put this reel together because I thought the reel was going to be the way that I, um, I get to be a filmmaker. I had in my head from being at NYU that all my favorite filmmakers, Scorsese, Coppola, Spielberg, like everyone had made a movie before they were 30. And I had this like self-inflicted, I have to do it or, I'm, or that's it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to make it. And I literally was in the editing room like 20 hours and I had some weird visual reaction seizure thing and I got a rush to the emergency room and while I was in the hospital I sat there and I thought the dumbest thing I've ever thought was like that there's a number I go if I'm really a filmmaker I don't care if I'm 40 50 60 70 I'm never gonna stop 
until I make movies. And it was almost like I had to have that revelation because the following week, I was on Long Island with my girlfriend at the time in the video store. I think it was a blockbuster. They were still around. And uh, I turned the corner and this guy is hitting on my girlfriend. <laughs> and he's like, I'm a filmmaker and I make oh, movies. Great. And, and then they're like, yeah, I'm a filmmaker too. He's like, yeah, what did you do? I go, you want to see my reel? And he's like, yeah, I'll see your reel. And then he saw my reel and he had, it was this guy, Fred Carpenter, who had made a bunch of indies on Long Island. And uh, he goes, yeah, you're, you're good, man. Um, hey, you want to you wanna direct this movie? You have 14 days and we have like, you know, $200,000. I'm like, can I read the script? And I'm like, yeah. So I read the script and it was just like really bad police drama. And I had seen his other movies and they were kind of these weird B movies. One was Gary Bergdorf as a serial killer, you know, transvestite serial killer. I thought, it's kind of cool. My first opportunity to make a weird movie. I read the script. It was all like police talk, but kind of like corny TV police talk. So I, I called up one of my buddies um, from NYU, Steve uh, Perros. And I go, read the script. I get to make this movie, but the script is not good at all. And they go, well, they let you rewrite it? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, see what you think? And then he goes, well, you love film noir. And I'm like, yeah. It's like this kind of corny dialogue can be easily shifted to like noirish kind of dialogue. And it had this whole flashback of uh, murder that happened in the 70s. And so we, we hold, I said, I'm going to rewrite it. He goes, you have two weeks to rewrite it. We rewrote it. Um, and uh, we had Jason Miller was cast in it, who was the priest in The Exorcist. He was nominated for that. Mm -hmm. And he also wrote that championship season. Beautiful man. He passed away a few years back. Um, he loved what I did with the script. It had a lot of depth. It was a dark, dark story. I think we had a 17 body count by the end of the movie. Oh, wow. <laughs> it had to have that. I had, a, I had to kill a bunch of people. I had to blow up a car. And so we made the story with the parameters that the producer wanted. And the other parameter was the producer had to be the lead. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And so we wrote a role that, you know, we kind of made him under his breath. And then he blows up and gets angry. And, and, and I kind of, we put together a movie that was kind of, kind of weird and cool. It was very Blue Velvet influenced because I had seen that at the time. So it was quirky, weird. Talk about tonally strange movie. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't get to cast everyone I wanted. It was like the visual effects, uh, the, the special effects guy had to be the bad guy. <laughs> so the level of talent was a little bit all over the place. So because I knew that, I played it a bit campy again with Blue Velvet as an inspiration. And so it was this weird, dark, uh, kind of funny uh, movie, um, which has one of my favorite final shots in it because I was a huge fan of The Graduate. And my favorite last shot of that movie is he finally gets the girl and the two of them are on the back of the bus. And, and Mike Nichols is brilliant because he just leaves the camera on them till it just gets uncomfortable. And this home, uh, my, in my movie, they're, they're doing all the stuff, running, killing, blah, blah, and they finally get away, the girl and the guy. And the camera does this creepy, just pull back and inspired by, by Mike Nichols shot. And, and it's just like, okay, now they have each other. Now what? Um, but yeah, I got to make this cool movie. And the first time you make a feature film, you think something about, if you really want to be a filmmaker, the scariest thing in the world is to make a feature film. Cause you could think, how can I hold all this in my head? Um, and I did it. And I was like, this is cool. And then Columbia TriStar had seen it those days of home video. And they bought it immediately and it got, went to home video. I don't think it's available on, on Blu-ray or anything now, but uh, it would be great if it was, I, I, I just got honored in the festival in Switzerland and they showed it. Uh, so well, that was the, the first time, time I'd seen it in years in front of an audience. It was dubbed in German. <laughs> 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 Seemed to go over pretty good. <laughs> so. So you literally got this job by being at a blockbuster video. Yeah, and having a, a hot girlfriend, I guess. <laughs> okay, that helps. Yeah, that helps. So did you believe, going back, it was Fred Carpenter you said? Yeah. And that's who it was. So did you believe him at that point? Like when he yeah, said, you yeah, I think I, my, I, was, I was in my hometown. My parents had showed me an article. Hey, look at this. Because I was in film, you know, I came out of film school. Look at this guy in our town. And it was like an expose in Newsday or something. And so I, I, I knew, I kind of knew small town I grew up in. I was like, oh yeah, that's that guy. <laughs> yeah. And then so you co you then helped reshape the script? Yeah, and the funny thing is, is so I had like, I didn't even have a real crew. We had like um, a guy who did like, uh, our gaffer did like, um, 
industrials, you know, this is out in Long, deep Long Island. And um, uh, the crew was all Hofstra students. And they were like first, second year students. So they didn't even have the equipment that I had at NYU. So they were like really green. Um, and But I'm, I'm good at rallying the troops and getting them to believe in the movie. And our 14 day shoot went for like 38 days because I got people to work for free for me. And, you know, but like I bought more film. It was like that kind of thing where like I used my credit cards and, you know, I didn't take any money. I think I was supposed to get paid money to direct it. And I just put that into the film. And yeah, and Lenny Weintraub was this, this investor. He was a real, really sweet real estate guy. And he invested in the movie and was excited to be a part of Hollywood. <laughs> we weren't quite Hollywood then, but there were some real actors. Ellen Green, she was a theatrical actress. She was in the movie. She was in like Little Shop of Horrors on Broadway then, or, or around that time. Yeah, so we just we just pulled it pulled it off, cut it on film. Um, my editor, um, Tom Lewis, has edited most of my movies. He, he edited he's my film school buddy. Um, yeah, the guy who do, uh, was a cinematographer on my travel documentaries was the cinematographer. So it was a bunch of NYU people came together to help me out. So it goes to home video. How long before then you get your next job, which is the wedding singer? So meanwhile, Adam was having his career was going in a really good way. And um, I was determined not to come to L.A. without a movie because I knew everybody was a director. And and Adam had seen the movie and loved it. And I remember um, he had his agent see it and they're like, oh, that's cool. You know, uh, and, and the fact that I did a movie, Adam couldn't wait for me to direct his movies. Um, he had done, I think, Billy Madison by then. He called me up and said, I'm working on a comedy album. You already made your movie. Come to LA, come for two weeks and help me with the comedy album. And it was an album called What the Hell Happened to Me. So I wrote on a bunch of skits. I acted on some of them. And then um, I did a music video for one of the songs. It was Steve Polychronopolis. It was kind of a precursor to The Wedding Singer because it was an 80s bully. But it was all about 80s wardrobe, <laughs> stonewashed pants and and the bi-level haircut. And I shot this video and I didn't realize like all eyes, because Adam was just starting to really excel. Every big wig in town came to see who's this Frank Karachi guy directing the video. And I'm just loving it because I'm getting like real equipment and you know, and and it had like all the comedians that were friends with David Spade, um, Rob Schneider, so many interesting cameos. It was like uh, 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 David Arquette, uh, Gary Shandling was in it. So it's this really fun, crazy, silly video. Um, and then I, on the album, we did a 23 city tour. The album went double platinum. It was like one of the biggest Sandler albums. So it was a good little run where I literally came for two weeks and I had a bag of clothes for two weeks and I didn't stop working. I got an editing system in our house. I, you know, we had a house in Beverly Hills and I was like editing all the videos myself. I'm like, this is great. It's like film school again. I'm like, this is got 20, 28, something like that. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm getting to like live with my friends, shoot stuff, people really seeing it, edit. I'm like, this is a dream come true. And then we did the 23 city tour. Like it was a rock and roll tour with a bunch of Adam's comedy songs. So like the Hanukkah song, um, he did a bunch of other songs like the Halloween song, um, Piece of Shit Car. A lot of the ones you know though, like um, the Turkey song for Thanksgiving. And I did sort of very inexpensive, um, I came up with the stage design. It was an outdoor drive-in movie in the summer and it was like beach balls and all this stuff. And, and, and I had the set designer from his movies do the set and, and I had a screen and on the screen I would do things like, there was a song about grandmothers so I got a bunch of grandmothers, shot them on green screen, dancing with spatulas. <laughs> and then I took like contact paper from like, you know, like grandma contact paper that you'd put in the kitchen. Oh, yes. Like really corny pattern. Right. And I green screened them again. I just like, it was like this weird, it would be inspired by like a Pink Floyd drug video, but it was just silly comedy for stoners. And then the other thing is we had a skit that like it was a super stoner skit that everybody loved. There was a talking goat. And the talking goat, these four stoners come across this talking goat and Van Nuys tied to the back of the truck. And they're like, oh shit, a talking goat. And Adam did the voice of the goat like, hey, <laughs> hey guys, uh, why don't you untie me? I'm kind of bored here. And I played the old man who used to beat the goat. And, uh, and, and so that skit was the most popular one. And um, 
I was like, oh, I got to film the goat for the concert because the kids love it. And when I say kids, they're like 20-something-year-olds and we're 30 at the time. And uh, so the goat opens up this show and people go nuts. And then I bring him back a few times. And New Line had seen the show and they were like, we want to do a talking goat movie. And, and, uh, and, and we're like, oh, that's cool. But like, we we're thinking of doing another movie though. And then we pitched them. I wanted to do a movie that was an 80s movie. And Adam and Tim had come up with an idea for uh, a wedding singer who gets jilted and has to perform weddings after he got his heart broken. And then I said, Adam, let's make that 80s because then you can sing songs and won't look like you're trying to be cool. It'll be a little retro. It'll take the curse off. And he said, great. And then we pitched that. And it's funny because it was 1995, 96, we're pitching an 80s movie. And people are like, 80s? That was six years ago. And I'm like, no, trust me, like we dress different. Like I have the same clothes from six years ago. I'm like, trust me, no, no. And then like, sure enough, I made, I learned my first, mis my first thing not to do in Hollywood. When I was pitching the producer, I go, think of how in Dazed and Confused, the 70s was a personality. And then the producer was like, Dazed and Confused made like $10 million. Why would you reference that movie? And I'm like, no, 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 just how cool it was. And I'm like, Oh, I get it. You just got to reference movies. When you, when you want to get money, you have to reference movies that make a lot of money. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, that's a good note. It didn't yeah. translate. I was like, no, it's how cool. All right, I get it. Uh, it's like the Titanic. No, that was not yet. <laughs> uh, um, so anyway, so we pitched that and they loved the idea. And then we, we kind of worked on a script. And then Carrie Fisher, um, New Line, hired her to spend time on the script because she was such the the script doctor for romantic movies and I got to spend just got to LA you know with my gym bag I'd only been there for a few months and next thing I know I'm at Carrie Fisher's house um, I'd have to go to her house every day when she was writing she would literally lay in bed and write she would watch TV she'd be like let's watch old movies and then I'd literally be laying in bed with Carrie Fisher going I can't believe I'm in bed with Princess Leia not you know just sure, working right, not right, right. Yeah. nothing and uh, and yeah we'd watch these old movies and she showed me all these great Oh, you know, old romantic comedies, um, Roman, Roman Holiday, like you name them, um, Breakfast at Tiffany's. And then we would write and, uh, and it was great. And, and we got to make this amazing story and, and, uh, and then Drew signed on. And, and um, before you know it, I'm like, all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I, I came, I still have not gone home. I still have this bag of clothes <laughs> and I'm directing the wedding singer and, uh, and, uh, I remember the first day pulling up on Sunset, the, the house we shot was with the old lady with the meatballs, Rosie. And uh, it's the first time I'm driving the set, right? I'm driving my little rental Honda Civic. And I'm like, why are these trucks here? I'm like, I'm used to making a student film. We had one truck. It was like truck after truck. And this is a low budget movie. It's like a $10 million movie. I was so intimidated by the time I walked to set <laughs> that there was all this equipment. I'm like, I need some dolly track and a camera. I didn't know you need all this. And, and uh, yeah, but I jumped right in and, and uh, I just did what I knew how to do. And, and, and I realized, oh, now I have a lot of crew. When you change things, it just happens fast. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and when we made that movie, we had no idea it was gonna hit. Like it was a little low budget movie and um, it just blew up in a whole different way. And then I thought, now I'm fucked because now I can't make all those little weird movies. <laughs> Why? Because you thought now you're going to be pigeonholed? Yeah, to yeah. Make, and okay. I was like, I kind of want to make this. And then I actually, the funny thing was, we, I was like, come on, we're on a roll. Let's do The Water Boy. So The Wedding Singer didn't even open. We made The Water Boy. Uh, and so in the middle of doing The Water Boy, The Wedding Singer opened. We flew home for the premiere. And I was like, wow, this is great. Now we now there's no pressure on the water boy. Like they gave us more money and time. We didn't feel like, you know, when you're making a movie, you have a gun to your head with budget. Um, and uh, yeah, but I did find it for a long time. I was pigeonholed. I, I had so many little movies I wanted to do and I'd be willing to do them for no money. And um, it was uh, once they put you in that box in Hollywood, it's hard. to. And I didn't know enough about how the business works to figure out how to make the little movie. It literally took me 10 movies till I got to make another little indie, you know. And I all along I'd been wanting to, you know, and the movie I just made now, Hot Air, it took like seven years to get that together. The little ones are really hard to get going just because, you know, it's always talent driven, you know. So you have to find a piece of talent that wants to do it.
How did you get clearance for all of the songs in the wedding scene? The wedding, well, platinum soundtrack, by the way, and they were really easy because most of them were one hit wonders. So they cost, you know, I don't even know what songs cost, but they would cost like five grand. There is um, uh, um, Jersey, greatest. Uh, bon Jovi? Bruce, Bruce. Oh, Bruce, okay. Sorry. The Bruce Springsteen song, you know, and like, um, 250,000 for that song. Oh wow. But, I mean when you when you go for the classics, right. they're 250. But all like things like White Wedding and and especially some of the ones you haven't heard since then, they were one hit even more one hit wonders. Yeah. They're like $5,000 a song, which relatively cheap um, at the time. So um, yeah, it was a really lucrative soundtrack. For, I didn't have a piece of that. That was my first movie, but uh, I have a platinum record on my wall. <laughs> so cool. Did you all work together in terms of what songs you really like, like Video Killed the Radio Star? Yeah, I, you know, um, uh, I was an 80s new wave kid, so I had all the music. Um, the Adam had his, you know, we both grew up on the same music. It's funny, he went a little more, I went more edgy and he went a little more commercial. And we did, the one thing we all often battle on is music. And then in hindsight, I look back and I'm like, it's a perfect balance that if it was all me, it would go too edgy. And if it was all him, you know, like, so we, like the song that I remember, there was a Hall and Oates song. And I was like, I want Haircut 100. That was more 80s. <laughs> and, and, you know, now when I watch it, people love the Hall and Oates song. So, um, but like The Cure, all that sure. stuff. The Susan Smiths. The Banshees. That was me. I was like New Wave. I had like right. blonde hair, shaved. I was that kid, so I was so like. So was I. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No Susie song in there. No, no Susie and the Banshees. I know. Uh, and we wanted Prince to open with 1999, but he wouldn't give any rights away. And also when Dove's Cry was supposed to be in the in the club scene, but um, David Bowie said yes to um, China Girl, which was a real oh, honor. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that was fucking wow. cool. Either, I mean. Prince David Bowie, win-win. <laughs> sure, sure. They're both not of this earth. Yeah, they're, they're both like, beyond. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Miss both of them. Yes. <laughs> what did making a movie teach you about filmmaking and the business? What did making a movie? Yeah, and it could have been your first movie, could have been subsequent movies. When did you finally feel like it clicked for you? Like, Oh, this is the movie making business. This isn't just. Oh, you mean the word, you're talking about the word business. Yeah. Well, I, I think when I pitched The Wedding Singer and I referenced um, the fact that it's going to be like Dazed and Confused, and the producer said, Dazed and Confused made like $10 million. Why would you reference that? That's when I realized that when you're trying to get a movie made, it's all about the box office in, in, in the Hollywood world. Um, it, 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 you know, at the end of the day, it's an investment for somebody, and and they and they want to make sure they make a lot of money. So um, you start to become aware that you have to let people feel confident that the movie has commercial appeal in in that world, and that's part of the reason I enjoy now delving into doing indies because you know you can have less pressure on that and more pressure on just telling a great story and. You're, you, you do it for not a lot of money with the freedom to have creative control to make something more specific that you want to do. Um, but I would love to have Paul Thomas, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson's career where he gets a lot of money to do whatever he wants. <laughs> um, but the one thing I think I learned from making more commercial movies is I try not to get up my own ass as far as like, I see younger filmmakers or I see filmmakers that never had to do commercial films and they sort of can start to make every moment drawn out. And what happens is if you draw everything out and make everything important, then everything's not important. It's like, I think I've learned from making commercial movies to not waste people's time. Like let things breathe when they have to, but don't like be like everything's great. But because you really can punctuate the things you want by telling the story more succinctly until it's that time that it needs to breathe. So I, I am kind of glad the way my career has gone. That my, I did my first indie, I've done a bunch of um, wider appeal movies and now, like when I made this movie Hot Air, I didn't have many days, I had 20 days to shoot it in Manhattan. Um, I didn't have the size crew or anything, it's even like smaller than a TV crew. I'd have like three grips, three gaffers. I'm really decisive. Um, so I'm able to be much more 
you, you kind of know what you want. Um, I was saying before, students, like when you fake your first film, what you want and what you get are so different and that's the painful process of the first time you make a movie. And the one thing that after time, like what I have in my head, I can get much closer. I mean, there's a lot of variables involved, but what I have in my head is a lot easier to get really close. Uh, so when I get in the editing room, I already know what I want. Um, it, it, it feels good. It feels good. And I almost think it's great that I'm doing, hopefully going to be doing more indies now because I can just make them much more efficient than if it was my first or second film. So when you looked at the footage for Murdered Innocence, was it a shock to you because you thought you were getting one thing and it didn't turn out that way? It was, by the time I made Murder Since I had made enough short films and even travel document. I, I looked through the lens and edited stuff enough that uh, and my skill set wasn't as good as now. Um, I learned a lot. Like editing took, that movie took a lot longer than, you know, I had to do this movie now, Hot Air, and I edited it in like three and a half months. And my editor, you know, while I'm shooting, I see cut and I can give a million notes and like I know what I want. I'm not afraid to experiment, but you get all the stuff the way you want and then you get time to experiment. So um, yeah, you just get better at knowing what you want. You get better at knowing how things are gonna feel. Um, you get better, it's like another reality of the movie and I have a more vivid image of that reality. That being said though, I always say like people make their best films when they first start making films and probably towards the end of their career. That, somebody else said that. It's like when you're really young, you make films because you're just daring and you don't care. And then when you're older, you're wiser. So there's something to be said about both ends of the spectrum. Interesting. So in the middle, you think people are too busy making something and they're too worried because is this going to get me my next job? Uh, I'm not sure of that. I hope I'm good in the middle too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But every movie from the first one to every one I do, I don't know who has the career where they know they're definitely getting a movie. Maybe Scorsese and Spielberg and, um, you know, even Scorsese has to tussle a little bit. But the good thing about being him is he can ask Leo or any great actor to be in his movie and they're going to say yes. So, <laughs> Well, that was part of the beauty of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was that even though this guy had what seemed like success, he was worried about getting the next one. Yeah. And the other character, Brad Pitt's character, was just, you know, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good if I hopefully I get something and I'll go up on a roof and fix an antenna and do these different <laughs> things. But I think that was the beauty that of was cool. that was the cool part of that. You know, a great contrast. So yeah. but I always think I always think about like Scorsese and Coppola were two of my right, favorite filmmakers. And it's like, you know, obviously Apocalypse Now Coppola did and Godfathers and and uh, and so many more. And I'm like, why is he not making films? Does he not want to? But I feel like there was a period of time where he did want to make films and it wasn't that easy or he didn't want to, he didn't want to deal with it. And it's, it's just sad to me that the industry can be very forgetful of some great talents. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not always fair <laughs> to, to some of the best. George Roy Hill was like one of my favorite filmmakers and he did this thing and he did uh, The World According to the Garp and, and, oh, yeah. and, and, and uh, which Cassidy and, and somebody told me a cab driver goes, yeah, I drove, I drove George Roy Hill home. This is going a while back. He passed away. Yeah, he's a little old guy. He lives in a little apartment. And I'm thinking, this guy made some of my favorite movies. And he just kind of like went away and just, you know, I'm, I'm sure he would have made more movies. And I always get really sad. I hope that's not me ever. <laughs> but that, in my head, I'm like, even if I have to take my iPhone out, I'll make a movie. <laughs> Do you think that's become because people's tastes change? It's not so much that ah we don't want you anymore. It's just the style and the and the taste and the tone of movies changes. I don't know. I I, I yeah they do, but I think I think a great filmmaker, you know, unless they really lost everything good about themselves, if they lost their soul, but if they're still a, a, a good human being they have something to say. It's not like, you know, unless they're done doing it, but I can't imagine a guy like George Roy Hill couldn't make, he probably didn't want to deal with all the politics anymore. I'm guessing, I, I'm projecting, I have no idea. Um, so that's, you know, it's just sad though that, that I do think it's not fair. Like, well, I wish Coppola, how cool would it be if Coppola came out with another film? <laughs> well, he also, now he has his winery. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. yeah. You can have a winery and make movies. That's it's true. Pretty easy. I don't think winery. he's squeezing the grapes. 
<laughs> but even with a one-hit wonder, you always think, is it because they couldn't get another film? I mean, even remember the band Yaz? Great yeah. Alison Moyet, I yeah, mean, yeah. amazing yeah. voice. And they're not one-hit wonders, but for a long time, they went away. Yeah. You know, you didn't hear about them. So is it because someone gives up on the business or the business doesn't want them? Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes people are too difficult. Like, there's a film that I love called Human Traffic, and it was a British director, and it was about, like, the whole, like, kind of ecstasy club scene. And it was like, I saw it, and anybody that saw it, it was a very small audience saw it that I know. It's just like a really heartfelt coming of age, but very hip, cool movie because it dealt with like ecstasy and kids doing drugs. And, but like in, in the heart of the movie was really, really good. And I couldn't wait to see what that director would do next and nothing. I keep, everyone's all checking and, and I don't think he's done anything. And I don't know, you know, making a movie, you have to be a lot of things. You have to be a filmmaker. You have to be a therapist. And I think you have to be a politician. And that's a hard part for a lot of people. Um, and the politics are my least favorite part of it um, because you get really distracted and frustrated. And, and um, But, you know, I just really want to make films so I'm willing to do what I have to do when it comes to, you know. And I try to do it from a positive place. You know, I'm not... Arrogance seems to work too for directors. That's just... I don't function in that place, so... I think it's easier though for some of those guys. <laughs> it seems like you just like to laugh. And that's great. Got me this far, why should I stop now? <laughs> <laughs>
what's a good story? It has to be honest and true and, 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 and meaningful. And sometimes it's the simplest story. Love is good. But you see a movie to experience love is good. You know, and sometimes it's a more complex, um, you know, emotion. I did Click and it was about, you know, fast forwarding through your life and, and, and you, you kind of, he wishes his way through all, all the bullshit of life. And, and, and the theme of the movie is like, life is what happens when you're living it. It's like, you shouldn't speed through it. So um, it's nice to just have relatable, it's nice when a story is relatable um, to the most part, I think. And, 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 and just to be honest. John Lennon, I think, is, yeah, life is what happens while you're making other plans. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I like quoting great people like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think someone had a bumper sticker of it. One of my other favorite quotes is, um, uh, you don't fail until you stop trying, Einstein. Oh, okay. That's a good one. Oh, <laughs> well, he's got me this far, so I'm going to go with Einstein and John Lennon. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> How do you direct a great scene? Like, what are you looking for? What has to happen? I, how do I direct a great scene? That's not a fair question. <laughs> no? You kind of direct every scene as best you can. Um, and then, you know, and then sometimes there's moments where you go like, wow, this could be the best scene in the movie. Um, so I don't know if you, you just try to service the story the best you can. So, so some movies, like, I feel like you want the hand of the director to push you around and push the camera, move the camera. And, and other movies you want to, you know, romantic comedy like, like um, Wedding Singer, I wanted to just step back and not feel the director's hand. So in that movie, I used colors to tell a story. Um, uh, Adam goes from like, um, when he's happy, blue. When he gets his, his heart broken, the camera dollies and you see red brick behind him. From that point on, he's in all maroons and reds because he's heartbroken. Um, he has like a his worst part is he goes to a red wedding. It's Italian, silver, black, garish, and he has the love stink scene. And he freaks out. And then he still has the broken heart of his ex, but then he's starting to meet Julia, who's happiness again. And in the bar mitzvah, it's all blue. He still has his red jacket. They bond over the little girl, and he takes off his red jacket because he finally loses the other girl, his broken heart. Um, so that was done in a way that you didn't feel the director doing it, but subconsciously it, it's there. Um, other movies I like flying the camera around and like, you know, click this canted angles and, um, you just try to service every scene the best you can. In, um, Hot Air, the indie I just did, I'd never broke on the fourth wall. And, um, part of the goal of the movie was to make, not pick sides, and then at some point I thought, well, the next level is, no, not, we're not picking right, being wrong, or left is wrong. But I wanted everyone in the audience to feel guilty for where we're at. And um, I, there's a speech that was in the movie where Steve has almost like a network moment where he breaks down and snaps on everyone. And uh, the writer, I said, make sure we hit everyone, like Facebook and, and Instagram and their phones. And, and he wrote this brilliant speech. And... Um, and when I shot it, it was just sort of happening. And I, I was like, oh, this is going to be great with even jump cuts. And, the, and I'm like, we got to break the fourth wall. And the very end of the movie, Steve looks down the lens and says, the American dream is dead and buried and you're dancing on its grave. And I was like, this is one of my, I never broke the fourth wall. I'm like, I waited for the right moment. And uh, so I wasn't, it, it's like you, you just try to direct every scene the best you can. And then it just sort of, you know, it happens sometimes where you feel like, that was pretty darn good. <laughs> do you storyboard? I shot list. Oh, you shot list. Okay. And then if there's visual effects or it's complicated, I storyboard because just time constraints. It's, you know, but I literally shot list. And my goal, my thing is you shot list the movie in order because you read it and you shot list it because you can evolve lenses and do stuff. I, I, whenever I hear a director shows up that day and decides what lenses, and I thought, if you're not sure shooting in order, you're not making a, you're not telling a real story. You're just a, like, to me, a movie's a vision from beginning to end. So I'll, I'll say in the beginning, let's start on wide lenses. So we're close and intimate. But at the end, you know, like things like that, you need to progressively do. So you need to plan it ahead of time. So, you know, when you shoot day 31, we're on the tight lenses. We're not on the wide or the color, or, you know, a shirt should be red. Not, so you have to plan all that stuff out in order. And that's just discipline. And, 
sometimes I think only like 10% of the directors really do the job right like that. And, and, and I think it shows like people that are great are great for a reason. It just takes work. <laughs> now the color thing came into play. It's funny. My first movie murdered in a sense. I literally had like, um, you know, it was like, again, it was like the guy had to be this guy and that guy. The guy was just like a construction guy. So I didn't have like a designer oh. and we were just using locations. And then I had seen Billy Madison um, with Sandler and I'm like, man, the production design, it was the first time I was like, is amazing. And I'm like, I want that guy. And, and this Perry Blake, who's done almost all my movies, because I was like, that guy's great. And we hit it off because the first movie we did was a wedding scene. And I'm like, I want to tell a story with colors, not camera moves. And so on every movie, like, it's all about, like, in, in Click, it was like, he, he talked me into doing the movie. He's like, you get to create the future. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And then I was like, oh, wait, the story's great. And we're like, one part of the future, everything's angular. And then the next, because we have a bunch of time jumps, the later part, everything's round again. And... And just and, and just even in like storytelling colors like what here comes the boom with Kevin James, he starts out as a horrible person that's just selfish and it's the winter and we made the color like we pulled all the saturation on made it really cool felt like the fighter the movie the fighter yeah. and then as he blossoms as a human being and as a teacher and he starts teaching his kids and you know we get more and more colorful and I adding color adding color to the set and then it, we actually did it so the seasons changed too. I timed the movie out so we were shooting an outdoor scene when the trees were blossoming and then it ends in Vegas which is like full spectacle of color. So if you see reel one, it looks like the fighter and you see the last reel, you'd be like, how are those the same movie? But if you progressively change a movie as you go, it, it, you won't, you, it'll just happen without you being jarred. Um, but yeah, I love using color to tell, tell a story. But that was, from getting a production designer, so, and, and, and wardrobe too, you start to realize the wedding scene, everybody's like color coded, same thing in Ridiculous Six, each western town had like a color palette that, and, and, and everybody, it's really, it really gets tricky when it gets to be hundreds of extras, you need a really good costume designer, and you need the DP or costume designer and production designer all on the same page. That's the thing that I love about doing bigger budget movies, because you have just, more control over everything and uh and it's funny after i did the indie i had the best time because i had nobody telling me what i could what i shouldn't shouldn't do and it was literally my final cut and then i was like man i'm really itching to do a big movie again and i'm back now i'm my next movie is going to be the legend of sinbad so i'm back into that world but then i'm like oh with that comes all the politics too so it's you know it's always a give and take <laughs> Well, in the 80s was so colorful, even thinking back to like designing women, you know, and they yeah. all had the great outfits and the shoulder pads and it was so colorful. Yeah. And it, you know, it was to me, the color palette in that movie, I was like, everything in the 80s felt man-made. It was like the 50s too. Like, so I was like, no 70s colors, no browns, no right. green. Everything was like fuchsia and purple and electric blue and... Because that's, that's my image of, of the 80s. All of a sudden we were making everything and everything, everybody's haircuts were cut. You know, right, people right. didn't have beards and like you know if they did it would be like more trimmed yeah li- I mean there was and, colored stonewashed jeans I had yeah. like purple and, and turquoise <laughs> yeah and everything like, felt like those old people did stuff to everything it didn't just right. grow out of the ground <laughs> five things the director should never do on set look distracted when they're talking to their actors um that's one of the things you have to do. You have to make sure you're always put on a good face for your actors because they're looking at you. They're, they're putting themselves out there and uh, you have to be there for them. So you always have to react, respond, and be positive. Even if you have a note, it should come from a positive place. So never be negative to your actors. Uh, that's only one, huh? Yeah, <laughs> four, four more to go. Um, only get angry when you're really angry. Because <laughs> I hardly ever, 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 ever get angry um, about something. But if I do, it works. <laughs> Nobody wants to see me upset. They're like, wait, you know. Uh, and that's usually like behind the scenes, not in front of people. But like, you know, if you're having a dispute with the studio or producer or something. Um, that's two. What else should you do? Obvious now. Hit on women. <laughs> or men. Yeah. Or men, sorry. Yeah. Or could hit you, hit on either. anyone yeah. in any physical any way. Gender. And that's always been ingrained in me. Like, you're in a position of power. 
I, 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 you know, that's always been my rule before the Me Too thing is just don't do that. It's just common sense. Um, uh, that's three. Well, yeah, that's another one. I would say if you have to even think about if a joke is appropriate, then you shouldn't say it. <laughs> you have to even contemplate it. So that's four. <laughs> okay, okay. Darn, that takes away all the best jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. It's funny, just for funny fun. You can't edgy, have right? any fun. Right? <laughs> and then the fifth one, what not to do as a director. Don't ever be late. My God. And don't ever be unprepared. Like, you just over-prepare. You can throw the plan out, but you have to be prepared. It's like, that's, you have a ticking clock from the minute you get there. And so if you're not decisive and, and didn't do your homework, you're just burning money and it doesn't end up on the screen. So six things. So six, you, you oh, get rid of the yeah, joke yeah, yeah. one. The joke one, I still tell jokes. <laughs> Who brought hot air to you? My manager, Ali Etree at 360 at the time, uh, said, hey, there's this really good script you should read. And it was on my desk. And I ha I'm the worst at reading scripts. I just take forever because I direct them while I'm reading them. And my producing partner, Amy Keene, who's done the last seven movies or so with me, um, was like, what's on your desk that you haven't read? And I said, yeah, it's over there. And she read it and goes, oh my God, you've been talking about this topic, about how polarized we are. This is like an amazing little movie about a girl who comes into a rat. I'm like, really? And we read it and we're like, oh my God, we have to get this paid. So it was literally you know, my manager to my um, producing partner, who's smarter than me. <laughs> Especially a reading. <laughs> are you a consumer, of the, a heavy consumer of a TV news? Yes. You are? Okay. Yeah, it gets me depressed. <laughs> it does. Yeah, I notice that you really can start to get, I've had to like turn stuff I, off. I escape it and, and mm -hmm. it's nice to escape it. And, and uh, especially all the headlines just are geared to get you upset. But we're in a time now where so many things are upsetting, you know, whether it's a, another school shooting or, you know, the president just disregarding the respect for his office or disregarding the Justice Department or we're just doing things that I just think are, I was always taught were wrong. Like wrong, seeing wrong being okay is not okay with me. And it, it is upsetting. But yeah, I have to turn it off though and, and, and check out and, and breathe and look at the stars and look at the air and, you know, but then I start worrying about uh, climate change. <laughs> right, entrails. And I'm things. like, that's the, that supersedes Chemtrails, everything. Right. Like, like once the planet's gone, I had this really depressing thought because I thought, part of you make movies and you're like, yeah, kind of want to be immortal. Long after I'm gone, my movies will play. And um, I started thinking, well, if the earth has like an ice age where it burns up, I'm like, well, I got all the arts gone. I'm like, Van Gogh, I'm like everything, Da Vinci. I'm like, so there's a lot more than our lives at stake. It's like everything that's been created for, you know, the last thousand years is going to be gone. So I think it's a high priority uh, making sure. Like, with climate change, like, why don't we just play it safe? <laughs> like, even if we're over overplaying our hand, like, I think we're better off. And I, obviously, we're not overplaying our hand by trying to get off carbon and stuff like that. But it's like, wouldn't that be the smart, safe thing to do? <laughs> When you read the script, did you want any changes to it? Did you want to embellish any parts? Yeah, well, when I first read, the, you're talking about Hot Air? When I read the Hot Air, it was pre-Trump um, era. And it's funny, because we were trying to get made, and then at some point I'm like, wow, Trump's gonna be president, let's read it again. And all of a sudden, the shock value, because Steve Coogan's character, Lionel, the right-wing talk show, was, says stuff like, let's build a wall, no, let's build a moat, like send them back, that kind of thing. And I'm like, oh wow, I lost the shock value, but I'm like, but it's even more necessary. that <laughs> This is becoming accepted. So um, uh, what did we change? The biggest thing we changed, there is a part in the movie where he does something atrocious. And in the original draft of the script, he sort of loses his career. And I thought, we got to reflect the now. And the now is his career would go that way. And so we changed that. And the other big change, two other big changes, was um, the speech that he did when he goes off the rails. It now, like I said before, he, he, I wanted to make the movie not just be left, right. I wanted to be as unbiased as possible, but I wanted everyone in the chairs in the theater to also feel responsible. 
So I sort of had um, Will, who's a brilliant writer, write a speech that kind of incriminates everyone for how polarized we are. Um, you know, talking about, um, you know, tweeting about, you know, kids in Syria, but then also buying yoga pants from a sweatshop in Bangladesh, like making us all feel like we're all hypocrites and let's all try to be better. Um, and then the other thing, Steve did a, br Steve's brilliant, by the way, as a producer, writer. Um, he has a big speech at the end. Um, and when he's, I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but it's a, it's kind of a healing speech. And Steve wrote a lot of the bits or gave little bits for the writer to, 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 um, say, and he really brought some really heartfelt stuff, um, uh, that the writer was able to put in even to the point where he quotes Obama saying, we can disagree without being disagreeable. And Steve's like, I know it's an Obama quote, and you're gonna call me on that, but you know, it's just, it's, he found a way to make a real nice balance to a character. When I first read the script, the biggest challenge was, how do we make this guy who's spewing this stuff likable by the end? And, and he manages to be likable, I think, and, and not like he has to turn into a liberal, or you know, he stays with his views, but now he approaches it from a better, a more, a, 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 with a place of more integrity. What are some tips to directors who are working with A-list talent for the first time? Well, generally with actors, you just have to remember, they're putting themselves out there. They're exposing yourself. The first time I was on a set, I was so preoccupied, worried about the camera and all this other stuff. And my producer was Jack Carpio, my roommate at the time was like, you gotta tell, tell them they were good, tell them they were great. I'm like, and I've never looked back from that since. Um, so in general, actors have to be coddled and told how they're doing and you have to put all your attention to them. With an A-list actor, even more so. <laughs> it's like, they're, they're putting themselves out there and, and, and you just have to be attentive. When a, when, a, when a take ends, it's like, be ready to give them a response. They're professionals. And you have to be professional, and your job is to give them feedback. Um, so it's easy to be distracted, especially if it's like your first movie, because you have so much going on in your head. And I'm sure a really good actor will realize that, but you're going to get a lot better performance out of your actors if you're there for them right after with a thought. Compliment them on what's good, and then tell them what you want to try different. I usually don't go, that wasn't good. I would usually say, that was good. Let's try one that's more this. You know, or, you know, um, and with an A-list actor, if they say they want to try something that you don't want them to do, I think you should probably let them have their take and not make it feel like, all right, you could do yours, but I'm never going to use it. <laughs> you can be like, okay, cool. Yeah, try one. You're like, so it's just about being positive and, and being there every step of the way and letting them know that you're super focused on them um, when they're doing their thing. Have you always been a people person? You seem like you just kind of know you have like a high emotional intelligence. Uh, yeah, I've definitely been a people person. I also think I'm pretty in tune. I think I'm sensitive to people. I can sit and watch people. And I think it's a part that's good about directing because a lot of subtle things people do. I'll watch like a couple sitting on the couch and I'm just bored somewhere and I'll be like, okay, she's mad at him about something he did. Okay, no, no. And I can kind of just read body language pretty good. Uh, and I guess in that way, I can sense when somebody's upset and it's easy, it's pretty easy for me to to turn things around by just being sensitive to people. I mean, I'm sure I'm not, I miss stuff. I don't want to be so, that's the other thing. Don't be so full of yourself that you think you always know the right thing. It's a combination of the both. But yeah, I, I definitely had that gift somehow. Do you think it's also coming from a large family where... You were around, I mean, you have a lot of brothers and sisters? Or uh, I definitely have a lot of brothers. Uh, sorry, I have three sisters. I'm the baby. Oh, I'm sure nice. that's part of it. Um, Italian family, very emotional. Everybody doesn't hold back. We stab from the front, not the back, like you said about New Yorkers. Um, <laughs> but yeah, everybody says it like it is. Um, I was always pretty sensitive. I cried pretty easily. Um, um, so I think that sensitivity is just part. I mean, I, I feel like sometimes I feel like, Everything I became was to become a filmmaker. I like to think that way. I'm like, if I was born in a different era, I'm not sure what I would be doing. Because <laughs> the technology you need to fit in the filmmaking and it all, it all fits together for what I'm good at, I think. We kind of touched on this earlier, but how have your expectations of the business changed 
since going to NYU, Tisch, being a filmmaker, this sort of journey that you've had, how have your expectations of making films and pleasing the audience changed? I, I the whole process of making films and has kind of been what I thought. I know it would always be challenging. I think you have this idea that once, I think anybody in any career, especially in entertainment, there's never like, I made it. There's always gonna be more challenges. Like you're always scrapping to get your next movie. You always set the bar higher. You don't wanna do more of what you did. So I think the one thing that surprised me that you're always working hard to get your next movie. Um, and the other part that I think I think is a weird thing that's gotten worse. I think it goes back to the internet. I don't think film critics should be film critics. I think they should be film enthusiasts. And I don't think um, the setup of the job right now is they feel like they have to critique and say what's wrong. I think we'd all benefit more um, if it was a film enthusiast and they would look for films that you need to see. Because all the ones that are popular and commercial, honestly, I don't even look at the tomato rating. My movies don't always get reviewed very well. People seem to be, they don't like Adam or they do like Adam. That doesn't help. Um, I look at the audience um, response, if anything. You know, I'd rather call somebody I know that saw the movie. But I, I, I think the audience is leaving theaters saying what they thought is a more accurate gauge of a movie's good. I think um, it's weird how critics will feel like there's certain movies they have to like and they don't like. And 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 if, if they weren't critics and they were film enthusiasts, their job would be great because they would list a bunch of movies that we all need to see. Right now there's probably 10 movies that aren't gonna get a whole lot of press and they're probably really some good ones. And I would rather read an article and like, oh fuck, I'm gonna go see that movie because I, 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 that, that filmmaker would never get seen. So I just wish it was more like that. When you go back to the, it was a kaiju cinema, it was, uh, it was um, Truffaut and Ghidorah, the new wave, they all had, they were filmmakers reviewing other movies and it was much more about embracing what they liked and less about taking pop shots at, you know. If you don't like a movie too, I also think if I was a reviewer, I'd be like, look, if you like action movies that do this, this, and this, you're gonna be happy. I, but I think reviews are just, generally are just, just you know, trying to cut it down or just, they just decide, okay, we're gonna like this movie and, and say we like this movie, you know. It's like, finally like, when The Water Boy came out, they talked about how sophomoric it was and how there were so many fart jokes. And I was like, there's not a fart joke in The Water Boy. You can say it's sophomoric, <laughs> that's not your opinion. And, and at the time, um, the Farrelly brothers had did the um, Kingpin and, and they embraced it, which was a really funny, great movie. But I mean, that one had fisting bulls and like they had full on shit. So it's like, the, the, it's not an honest, um, you know, nobody's, from, it's not an honest uh, system. So I, I, I think there should be film enthusiasts. So when you ask me about the filmmaking, that, that's one of the things that, that disappoints me. And um, yeah, and that, and that you have to always fight to get your next movie or work really hard to get the next one. Do you think the same way with social media and we're outing people and we're, we're putting our thoughts out there, there's a power in trying to take things down? There's definitely a negativity um, that, that seems to excel. Um, and, and, and I don't know how we have to reinvent it, but I guess it starts with each and every person. And, you know, listen, as an artist, that's what I'm going to try to make people. As long as you have integrity, as long as you're, everything goes back to integrity. If you have integrity, you're not going to, take a pop shot at somebody and you're gonna give a balanced argument or I don't like this for this reason, but you might like it. You know, if you're more, if people are more fair, I think we'll be okay. Um, it's that lack of, of seeing the person's face that you're, you're picking on that, that the internet does, that, that, that causes it, you know. Louis C.K. did the whole thing about how he doesn't want his kids to have a phone because when you're a kid, you, your tendency is to punch a kid in the face and then the kid starts crying and then you realize, oh, I feel bad. And then you form empathy. But on a phone, you punch a kid in the face by saying something mean, but you never get that response. So it's that lack of, of, of being able to form empathy that, that, that's, that's missing with the internet. I don't want to take technology away. I just want us to elevate ourselves to be better people, to be able to handle our toys. <laughs>
Do you think most film critics should have gone to film school? I mean, I'm not sure the background. I haven't done research. I on mean, my most... feeling, and I don't want to sound like, I feel like a lot of them went to film school and they, they just didn't apply themselves to make movies. And so there's a frustration. I, I, I'm not everybody. There's some people that just love films. and and uh, But the feeling I get, you know, is that, you know, it's, it's sometimes I'll write back to a film critic in a very, not angry, I'll always be like, oh, there's somebody who wrote something about um, Blended, and, and I was like, well, my intentions weren't that. My, I, in a very straightforward way, I was like, I tried to make something that wasn't typical. I wanted to make two people falling in love over parenthood. Not, and then the guy wrote back, like, I forgot the directors are human beings. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was such a great feeling. I was nice. like, because I'm like, I felt really bad because Blended, by the way, people love that movie, kids love that movie. And the, the, it was one of the few times that the critics, they don't usually bother me, but there's three amazing kids in that movie that, that are more. There's one, two, three, there's five kids in the movie. And they love the movie, they love making it. And they loved the premiere, and they saw the people laughing and loving the movie, and they couldn't wait for the reviews. And I was thinking, oh, these poor kids are going to get their hearts crushed, and and they did. And they were just like they couldn't believe that the movie got shredded, you know, uh, to pieces. And I forgot like why not wake up on Rotten Tomatoes, but probably like fifteen or something. And uh, it's not fair. Like that movie is not. If you, I don't care what you say. That movie you compared to a bunch of other movies that got. Higher ratings. It, it was it delivered on what it was supposed to do, and so it bugs me when like people that are critics are just so easy to be like, "Fuck that! This movie's predictable, and this is that, and that, that you know that kind of thing." But even the great critics do it. If um, Siskel and Eber is really funny, if you go back to um, the Waterboy interview that might be online, um, Ebert was like, he kind of gave it like a like this movie was. Not great, and we're sophomore, blah, blah. and then Siskel goes, "I can't believe you!" And I go, "Oh my God, he's gonna <laughs> like the movie." He goes, "How did you even watch it?" And oh, I thought, no. "Well, that just says exactly <laughs> what's wrong. Like, you can't say that. You can't go in that biased." <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's not always fair, but I, 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 for me, what matters is how people feel, and the ultimate um, validation for me is. My movies are on TV for 20 years, and they run over and over and over. And, uh, and I can't say that about a lot of the other movies that came out those years. So that, that, that what I, and in the long run, that's what, I, that's what matters. I'm like, I don't know. I can't guarantee a movie's going to get reviewed well. I can't even guarantee it's going to you know, make a lot of money. I just know I'm going to make a movie that's going to be emotionally honest. It's going to be a story that I think is important, and it will probably have a shelf life. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life was the reason I wanted to make movies. And my parents were, you know, they're in their 80s. So they were like, oh my God, that movie bombed when it came out because it was depressing. It came out after the war. And then I was like, oh my God, this is like the classic of all classics. And I was like, I always go to that, like, oh good. The movies don't have to do well when they come out. They have to do well over time. And that's the true test. Once you say yes to directing a movie, what are some of the first few steps you're taking? Well. You've read the script, so usually the first thing is, let's now make the script better. Yeah, I usually you want to get the script firing on all cylinders. Um, meanwhile, you're trying to put the best cast together. Um, it always starts there. And then once it comes to the film, I can't wait to start to visualize and shot list what the movie is. And you really can't do that until you location scout. Because that sort of determines what your shots are going to be a little bit. Um, so I just, that's, those are the first, pro and you know, obvious things you start to, you either know a DP that's perfect or you start interviewing DPs. Um, uh, certain roles like, like, you know, you know you're going to use your editor and stuff like that. Um, but what I've learned about um, a movie is it's like, it starts to have its own soul. So when creatively you're trying to figure out like what color do we paint the wall, it's what's cool about a movie is it starts to answer itself. <laughs> like you look into the soul of the movie and you go, that's what it should be. Um, so I, I, I get excited when it, it starts to kind of become its own, you know, thing. I haven't had kids and everybody's like, you know, you haven't had kids. I'm like, well, right now I've had movies and they've been my kids. So I do feel like they take on their own 
life. Um, so it's about, you know, letting it start to become what it's supposed to be. It's a, it sounds very esoteric, but that is pretty much part of the process. And, and, uh, and as the pieces come together, it starts to, I don't know if it was always there or the, the, the you know, was the soul of it there and then you add on it and it evolves or, or does the soul happen from all these people being attached and involved? But um, it's probably something that, that touches me inside and then that's the thing I look at to how do you cast it, how do you bring people together, how, how do you answer all these questions um, on how to, how to best make, uh, how to best tell the story. And you tend to use a lot of the same people that you I, I definitely have, um, yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a comfort. But it's always nice too to like once in a while bring in a different production designer because it takes you out of your element and you know, but I, I, I try to use the same production designer, the same editor, um, I, but it, through different reasons, scheduling this, that, it doesn't always work out and you always like embrace the, 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 the fresh perspective. So yeah, a little both. But it's nice, like I, like I hadn't worked with um, Larry Gilliard since The Waterboy, and I watched, he, he, he was the kicker in The Waterboy, and I watched his career uh, as he went on to The Wire and done some really good stuff, I'm so happy for him. He was always a good New York actor, and then when I was doing um, uh, Hot Air, I was like, oh, he'd be great as the radio guy. And so it's so much fun to have somebody gone on their journey and come back now with a whole new set of talent. Yeah, so a little both. What's been the easiest year for you as a filmmaker, and then what's been the most difficult? Easiest year for me as a filmmaker. The easiest year. A couple of different times come to mind. I think when I made Around the World in 80 Days, it was such an amazing joy to have an international crew all my travel, like everything I life had led up to that point. I traveled the world. I'd been to the Great Wall. I was like, I know where we're going to film on the Great Wall. And to lead such a massive, it was like, I don't know, the crew was like six, eight hundred. It was like we had like 400 Thai people. We had 100 British people. We had um, a, a crew from Germany. To just be the leader of that bigger of a group and to have everyone, like I have people stop me on the street and go, that was the best time I ever had. Uh, making a movie and it, it was almost like a life experience to be in all those places and all those parts of the world with all different languages and you know we had one scene where um, there was people spoke Chinese, Thai, French, we had all these translators all this thing and we shot this dinner scene I wanted it all to take place at at magic hour and so we were filming in this Chinese village that we built in Thailand and at 4 30 we'd run up to the table and and it was just pulling off like amazing stuff because everybody was in sync and it was amazing that the challenge was so many people were just different, so many different parts of the world that it was like that that to me was like maybe it wasn't easy in that it was the most uh rewarding and most difficult i think it was right after doing the wedding singer and the water boy and having massive success in trying to figure out what I wanted to do and I was really cautious about what next career step. I was trying to make a smaller movie. I was having a hard time doing that. And it was it was odd because you would think it would be the easiest time in somebody's life, but it was important for me not to just just follow a path that everybody was shoving down my throat, you know, and and and, and like do this movie, do that movie. Then, and, uh, and um, I passed on a ton of great movies um, just because I was like, I don't know if that's what I should do. So it was difficult to have that and feel like, well, am I blowing an opportunity? And, and then I just had to take stock of myself and say, well, I'm a good filmmaker, so let me just capitalize on that. Do you think that's something that you don't hear much about in the industry? You always hear about how to make it, quote unquote, but nobody gives you the tools or, or information on what happens when you actually reach this really high level and everybody's patting you on the back and emails are coming in, phone calls. Yeah, I think it's easy to, you look, how many people are super famous and then they can't do anything. And and and, and it's a sad story in, in a lot of entertainment, a lot of different industries, but mainly entertainment. And it's because everybody wants you to cash in and do more of the same. And 
to to me it was always important that I get to make movies for my whole life. So I didn't want to like just burn out and 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 just do what everybody wanted and and uh you know, I probably could have made a ton more money than I did if I went that route. But um I'm really happy now and I'm making little movies. I'm going to make another big movie. I, you know, you, who knows? Maybe I would be doing bigger movies and little movies anyway, but I just have to follow what I think is right. I think that's my advice to people because it's easy to get sucked into like everyone's going to want to make you, to, especially when you have success, everyone's going to want you to cash in and cash in could be good or, or could be bad. You know, it's like you, you, it's all to yourself what you, you kind of know inside what the right thing to do is and and if you don't you shouldn't just do it <laughs> you should f- spend the time figuring it out <laughs> so go travel the world and yeah, exactly. be on a mountaintop in tibet and <laughs> ask yourself <laughs> yeah that's got to be very difficult and i think a lot of people think well if i just reach that i won't have any trouble it'll, it'll be uh, there's never and the, other, the, other, the one question i get asked all the time is what was your big break i'm like there's never one big break there's a bunch of little breaks and you have to capitalize on them as much as you can. It's like, thank God I got into NYU. I, I didn't even you know, realize my SATs were a big deal. I was pretty smart. And uh, if I didn't get to NYU, I wouldn't even realize you could make films or maybe I would have found it another way. And then, you know, and then I got to NYU and my student film won some awards. And, uh, you know, and then I got to do a music video with Adam Sandler and then that music video was really good. And then I got to do it. It's like, it's never one break. Nobody has one break. No, I don't care who it is. Um, <laughs> it's never one break. You, you just, um, you just got to capitalize on every one of those breaks. And sometimes you're going to make a mistake but, and you got to pick yourself back up and keep searching for that next opportunity to do what you do.